Greetings again, my friends. I'm Nate Rakowitz, and this is Fuse Bites. It's a podcast about AI readiness in companies this season, and I'm excited to have joining us today, Burhan Hamid, who is the CTO of Time. Welcome, Burhan. Thanks, Nate. I'm so happy to be here. It's great to see you again, and congratulations on your recent promotion. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's uh, it's been a long run uh, with you, with your ride over there at Time uh, for sure, uh, and timing before that. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been twenty four years altogether um, that I've been in the tech space, uh, and mostly all of it has been at Time Inc. Time Media Publishing. It's been quite the ride. I've seen a lot of ups and downs. I've seen uh, uh, seen it all. So, could you explain a little bit about your background and how you came to be the CTO of Time? Uh, how much time do we have, Nate? Uh, we have uh, <laughs> as much time as you'd like. <laughs> um, it's you can take it all the way been, back to when we actually worked together as part of the same time Time Warner family. You know, it, it, we did, we did. It's it, it's been a big family. Time Time Warner. I mean, I started when it was uh, it was right when AOL had bought Time Warner in two thousand. Um, you know, I started answering phones at a help desk you know, way back then. Uh, I missed Y two K. But I remember showing up and seeing stickers of Y2K on every approved computer uh, across the across the entire office space. Um, but I was, I, I, w- I was part of Time Warner for Y2K, so I went through that process uh, in the model I had over at HBO. And uh, so we had Y2K, um, and and they were still having us work on COBOL applications at the time. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, it was it, you know time. Time Inc. specifically um, was a special place. It was, uh, I just got together last night with a group of people that had been there for 30 plus years. Um, and it's basically like everybody I worked with was family. But the the most interesting thing and the best part of Time Inc. though for me was that I was able to bounce around from place to place to place. So I started answering phones. I moved over to desktop support, uh, helping people uh, fix their computer problems at People Magazine. I grew from that into uh, a management role at Entertainment Weekly, uh, where I got to meet some some of the, the most amazing uh, people in the media space, uh, some of the smartest people I've ever worked with. Um, so I, I was able to do so many things and evolve my career and learn so much about the different aspects of technology, both from what used to be called IT, to software engineering, to operations, to to, to all of it um, over the course of 17 years. And so when uh, when Time was spun off and bought by Mark and Lynn Benioff, I got an opportunity to come here and uh, really uh, separate the country, the the company from Meredith, who had bought the uh, bought Time Inc. And we got to build everything from the ground up at time at the new independent time and that was super exciting to me i really wanted to be a part of what that future for time would be at the time back then it was we were a 97 year old 96 year old company and i wanted to make sure that i helped time get to its hundredth year and set it up to be to be uh, a force for another 100 years and i'm really uh you know grateful and um, you know, honored to have had the opportunity to do that um, now as CTO, uh, but effectively leading the, the the product and data and engineering organizations over the the four and a half years that I've been here. Um, so title is a title, not a big deal. Uh, it's really about the work and and doing the work and the team that uh, that I've got, uh, being able to deliver on some really fun and interesting work at the end of the day. Well, a huge congratulations to you on reaching time 100. I know there's been a lot of celebrations about uh, that. Uh, it's a huge milestone for you and for the company. Uh, and, and, you know, it's an honor to have you on the program today. Thank you, Nate. I, I really appreciate it. Um, looking forward to the conversation. Um, you know, we've been we've been partners with Fuse Machines for uh, four years now. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to see what you all are building as well. As as this grows, yeah, for sure, and we appreciate the uh, the uh, the customership. Uh, that's that's <laughs> really great. Um, that's a word. So, 
So the the uh, podcast today and this season is focused on AI readiness in companies. Um, you know, we hear all about AI everywhere you go. You can't get away from it. Um, and you'd think it would be easy for companies to implement AI, given that everybody's talking about it. Uh, but the reality is it's complicated to implement. Um, and what we're trying to do with this podcast is bring together thought leaders like yourself, C-level executives, um, to share insights, best practices that you've seen as you've brought in AI for the first time or the second time or the third time, uh, whatever it's been, you know, what are some of the things that you've seen? Because it certainly is complicated when you try to bring it in for the first time. And so I'd love to learn a little bit more about your experience, because I imagine that AI is just one part of your portfolio. Uh, as a CTO, you're looking at all technology within the company. Um, so how are you thinking about evaluating AI and setting it up to maximize the probability of success, given that it can be so complicated in companies to get off the ground? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, this is this is not the first wave of AI, right? Uh, there have been companies, including Time and, and technologists for many years that have been in the machine learning space and the AI space. Um, and we built AI, <laughs> excuse me, AI products for years, right? Um, now, the new light that has been shined on AI really is exciting because it brings it to the forefront of what every company is thinking about. And the emergence of large language models has really um, accelerated that. Now, the in terms of maximizing the probability of success, right, or figuring out how to successfully deploy AI roadmaps, I think it starts with first defining what success means to you as a company, right? So um, for me, I'm thinking about AI success through the products that we're building, right? So there are AI, AI products that we are working on um, that are meant to drive a particular metric for success. So for example, for time.com, we would want to build a product that increases a very specific metric like pages per session or time spent on a page. Um, so for us at time, very specifically, we've defined that metric of success, then thought about, okay, what are the ways that we can leverage all of our tool set that's available to us, including AI, to be able to build a product that uh, that does help improve that metric. Now, if we're going to use AI, how, how do we make sure we do it in a way that's responsible, uh, ethical, uh, that keeps a human in the loop, right? Like that's super important in the, especially with large language models uh, today. Um, how do we listen to our audience and make sure we're building something that actually resonates with them, right? And enriches their experience on our platform. And then finally to, and we'll talk about this, I'm sure a little bit later as well, but like it's, it's super important for me to be able to get something to market relatively quickly um, and test it out and see what the feedback is, see what the data tells us how it's performing on, right? Like you've defined the metrics for success, is this actually help drive the, helping to drive the needle towards that success? And if it is, then how do we iterate on that and get it to scale um, in, in a way that will continue to drive that metric for success? That makes a lot of sense. Uh, starting with the business outcome that you're trying to achieve uh, and then layering up the um, AI applications towards that. Uh, and making that success metric something that you can measure um, so that you can really see the tangible output of AI. Um, but getting it to production can be such an impediment. Uh, and there can be so many obstacles that you can face uh, in trying to scale it up to a production level. And with the traffic that time sees, I imagine even getting it to that point to even test is uh, a challenge. And I, I wonder if you could talk through some of the impediments or obstacles that you have to go through uh, when trying to scale up um, these things, even to be able to test them. Yeah, I mean, I think the 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 tech portions of that are relatively straightforward, right? Like you can release to 1% of your audience or 10% of your audience to test things out, and we do that all the time. But I think some of the impediments for AI-specific projects um, are, I mean, the most obvious one and the most challenging one for us is all of this is really new. Even though it's now, you know, a year and a half old, 
um, every, it feels like every few months there's an update to a model being released, right? We're, we're at Gemini 1.5 Pro now. We've got small language models now. We've got, you know, there, there's so much that's being released. And it's really important if you're an engineer working on this to keep track of what uh, is the label on the release? Is it a preview release? Is it a pre-release? Is it generally available? Because we've learned uh, through through our testing that if something's in preview, things might break without without us even being aware that changes were made in the background to a model, right? So um, definitely keep an eye out for for using stable versions of software. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we've we've always known to do this, but with 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 AI, it's just kind of like Oh, I want to. I want to. I want to test the latest and greatest. Let's let's check it out and see what we can do, um, and test it. But for your produ production releases, make sure you're using stable code. Um, the other impediment is hype. Uh, you know, every the expectations are sky high now for what the possibilities are with AI, and I have to do a job in managing that. Right. Um, if there are expectations, uh, you know, people are throwing numbers out there, like thirty to forty percent increase in productivity using using AI. <laughs> what does that mean? Right. How do you measure that? Right? Like, um, you have to now. Now, every executive is asking for a thirty to forty percent increase in productivity. Right? Like, it's it's so managing the hype is probably the biggest impediment in terms of uh, in terms of an AI project because there's expectations that it'll get done right away. It'll be perfect. And uh, it'll change the transform the entire business overnight, and that's just not the reality of it uh, for most businesses. Um, it it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. The way to build a roadmap is to define the success, um, build out a product, build out a small version of it, test it out with a small user base, and then continue to invest in the growth of the product and pivot if you need to to help it go in the right direction. You, you talked about um, the hype, managing the hype. I, I imagine culture comes into play within an organization then. And, uh, you know, there are different layers of culture. Uh, and so when, and among that, uh, you've got the layer that's the executive management, you've got mid-level management, you've got staff people, all of them have, you know, their own culture and their different and their own expectations uh, about that hype. How do you go about managing that uh, across those different levels? Um, lots of conversations. Right, uh, lots of one-on-one -on -one conversations, but also each layer, and it's not just the layers, but it's also it's horizontal layers, but it's also vertical layers. Right, each department is going to have a different purview on or or point of view on what AI brings to the table. Right, um, there are going to be departments that are concerned about the loss of their jobs. So it's really about getting back to responsible AI and thinking about what are the ways that we can align as an organization in the best way to use this tool to help us grow as an organization um, that aligns with the overall values that we have as a company. Um, and Tom's biggest value is trust, right? So we have to make sure that we are maintaining that not only externally, but also internally. Um, so it's, it's challenging, um, but it's also once the company, like the leadership in the company is aligned, um, it trickles down from there. Got it. So the episode today, we're you know honored to have you here as a chief technology officer uh, there at Time. Um, and we want to get into choosing the right AI technologies and algorithms as a topic as well. Uh, so I'd love to know what factors that you consider when choosing uh, the right uh, AI technologies and algorithms for the solutions that you've identified to tackle. Yeah, I mean, for me specifically, it's um, I'm big on partnerships. I, I think that the most important thing, um, and going, it's going back to trust, right? Like it's building a relationship with tech partners that will help that will help both companies, right? Um, so, to me, we've uh, we've got excellent partnerships with with Google Cloud. Um, they've come to the table and helped us build um, for, for several years now. Uh, we've got an excellent partnership with Fuse Machines. We've got an excellent partnership with several other platforms out there. And, and to me, 
that is key, right? Uh, because that way you're all in it for the long run and everybody has, has skin in the game. Um, after that, um, I think about you know, speed to market, how fast we can get things um, built uh, when evaluating different AI tech. Um, so is uh, is something in preview or is it actually stable, right? Is it is is this just an announcement that's a marketing announcement or is there an actual real product behind this? Um, so that that's that's important for me. And then, you know, cost. Cost is a huge factor, right? Like if I'm thinking about um, what it's going to cost to be able to uh, deploy something and doing an ROI analysis on it, making sure that it aligns with what we talked about earlier, the success metrics and do those success metrics actually drive revenue or a savings of cost, that all ties, that all comes into the equation as I'm thinking about all the the potential for different AI technologies that we could be using. When starting with a use case, um, how do you try to line up the, those technologies with the use case? So I, th I think that's great that you're talking about the partnerships um, and evaluating the specific technologies within those partnerships that they might have to offer. Um, how do you think about lining those, those up, the business questions, the use cases with the specific technologies um, that are offered either by these third-party vendors or by custom solutions that you might build in-house? Yeah, it's really an interesting one to think about, Nate. It's, um, I, I, you know, I'm, hesitant to say this, but I feel like what's been happening is it's been backwards, right? So the technology has been released and everybody's looking to retrofit use cases to it yeah. versus the, the other way around, which is like you have a business need and the technology helps solve business need, right? Or you have a use case and the technology helps solve that. Um, so to me, as a technologist, that's very exciting, right? Like there's there's uh, there's a new thing out, and you want to see what you can use it for. And I've been very careful at time to make sure we're not just slapping a chatbot onto the user interface at time, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, because that's everybody's inclination. Oh, there's this new cool tool. Let's let's yeah. make time GPT and and call it a day, right? right? Um, so it's going back to what we talked about all the way at the beginning, thinking about how we build products that are going to enrich the, the audience experience on time.com. And a use case for that, for us, and it's a natural one for, uh, for AI and has been for quite some time, is content recommendation, right? Um, and uh, we've been uh, developed, we've developed something with Feeds Machines called CRX. Uh, it's our content recommendation engine at time. It's been in market for three years now. Um, and what is the evolution of that product, right? As a use case for driving um, more engagement on the site, what is the evolution of that now in light of the advancements in AI? So can we now take content recommendation to the next level using LLMs? That's the, that's the type of use cases I'm thinking of. Um, and, and then when we think about what types of technologies to apply to it, it's what's, which LLM to work with, right? And what we do is we experiment with all of them. We will run uh, multivariate testing. Uh, we're, we're we're running uh, both GPT four, GPT three point five, Gemini one point oh, Gemini one point five Pro, uh, and preview mode. And uh, we've set up uh, ways to evaluate the performance of each of those for the product that we're building. Uh, and the, we're evaluating the performance with a human in the loop. So it's not a it's not really a a data intensive way of evaluating performance because what we're getting is uh and, and just to be transparent we we have the lms reading the article and pulling out topics from it right uh, it's an old NL, nlp use case that we're now applying an llm to mm -hmm. so now a human can review a human can review those topics and compare okay does one model extract the the topics that i would have chosen versus another versus another and and so that's that's how we're actually evaluating different algorithms, different models um, with the products that we're trying to build for the use cases that we have. Got it. Um, so you, you talked about um, the the importance of those partnerships as well. Um, how do you think about internalizing some of the capability uh, as you move forward with these things? Is it uh, you know how do you think about 
um, the trade-offs between using off-the-shelf AI solutions uh, or third parties uh, versus doing this in-house, or is there um, uh, is there a, uh, a transition that goes on along that spectrum? Yeah, um, I, I, I actually think about it from both perspectives. Uh, I like to I like to get something to market with something off the shelf um, because that will help get something out there to prove out and test. Um, and we did this we did exactly this thing for our CRX algorithm. We started with an off the shelf recommendation engine, mm -hmm. and then we had the team internally that gave the team internally the the time that they needed to build something that would compete with it. And so then that team built something that competed with it and. Until our internal product performed better than the uh, off-the-shelf product, we kept the off-the-shelf product. But as soon as the internal product was performing better, we had a winner. And so that's the way I think about it because you 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 unlock a bunch of uh, features right uh, by doing that. You you give your team time to build something. You give them a point of reference. You still get something out to market relatively quick. Um, and you collect the data that you need to be able to measure against and see if it's even worthwhile continuing to invest in the product to build in-house. So um, that's the approach I like to take, um, unless there is an opportunity to build something that is I IP internal uh, internally, right? That will mm -hmm. give you a competitive advantage that no one else has. And in that case, you, you absolutely will invest uh, internally. Um, but still, I would I would still continue the approach of um, test, iterate, test, iterate, test, iterate. So as as you're running things in parallel, how do you think about ROI uh, and justifying the additional uh, parallel um, processing that's going on there with the team members? Well, with, with something off the shelf, that's where the partnerships come into play, right? You can leverage using a partner to help build the thing off the shelf. Yep. Uh, while your internal team now has time to build something that competes with it, right? Um, so you're, you're, th that's exactly why, how it all ties together with the partnerships, uh, mm -hmm. where, where we're looking to work with a partner and, and, and it's incentive for the partner also to build um, you know, something better. So at the end of the day, they're getting product feedback to help their product grow while we're incentivizing our team internally to compete uh, with this third-party product. And so everybody gets something out of that at the end of the day. And as, as they're building those things as third parties, how do you ensure that the chosen AI technologies align with the company's existing technology infrastructure uh, from that integration standpoint? I often find that integration testing and integration of systems is sometimes the co most complex part. Um, so how do, you, how do you tackle that? I mean, there's, we do a lot of work um, on Google Cloud. So we, you know, our, our stack is built there. And so we looked for partners that are going to work in that platform. But that said, everything is so interoperable these days that it's less of a concern than it used to be, right? Uh, we can easily, I mean, even though we're working in Google Cloud, we're basically writing functions or, or Python code or, or, or JavaScript code that is calling uh, an API. And that API can be OpenAI's API. It doesn't have to be you know, Gemini's API. Um, so it's really not been a challenge for us to, to have to just be contained to one particular environment. As long as the, the technology we're working with makes itself available through an endpoint that we can hit, that's all we need. So it sounds like you've got some good approaches here um, to inter interoperability, uh, bringing these things together, um, uh, bringing in the third party vendors to really fast track the use of AI, um, having the specific IP uh, uh, focused a AI handled by custom internal staff. Um, it sounds like you're on top of it over there at time, which is uh, great to hear. Um, how do you stay abreast of all of the technologies and all these changes in order to be uh, on top of it? Like, what are some of the trends that, that you're watching out there? And, and how are you staying abreast of all of these changes in technology that are happening? Because there is always uh, a new thing. There's a new shiny object out almost every day. Um, how are you taking, a, how are you staying abreast of that? It's really hard, Nate. 
it's really <laughs> difficult to, to stay on top of it all. It's, um, <laughs> you know, I set up, it's funny, I set up a bot in my Slack that, uh, that anytime there's, it's just monitoring search terms in Google and sending across any search results that are tagged AI. And you can only imagine what that bot's sending me, right? Um, sure. But but no, I think, you know, there's, first of all, a uh, plug for time.com. Uh, Time's writing quite a bit about AI. We're releasing the Time 100 AI in September. Um, it's a list of the 100 most influential people in AI. Um, it, Time's actually invested from an editorial standpoint in AI as well. And, and there's some really influential and important coverage about ethical AI that, that the Time team does editorially. Um, the things that keep me in the loop the most, though, are um, one, working on it, right? Like literally being immersed in it on a day-by-day -day basis, you, you discover everything that's available to you. Um, two, the partnerships are key, right? Uh, going back to that, where your partners, you have to lean on them to say, all right, if we're partnering with, you know, one of the top cloud providers in the world and the company that's pushing forth an agenda in AI, they're going to keep you up to date in that by partnering with them. Uh, so we meet regularly with our partners and learn about what their roadmaps are. Um, then, you know, podcasts. Um, I like the Hard Fork podcast. Um, there, I like the Lex Friedman podcast. Um, you know, I, I, I like the Fuse Bytes podcast. Plug nice. the Fuse Bytes podcast, uh, <laughs> episode two. Um, and uh, and then there's uh, some AI tools out there that are actually great for um, improving how I operate on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of learning. Uh, I'm a big fan of perplexity.ai. Um, they have a discover feed that covers the top 10 or 15 topics every day that, uh, that you can look at. Some newsletters also. So yeah, it's really, it, it's a lot of consumption of media in very different formats um, that, that helps, but really, you have to just immerse yourself in it and build it and do it. And then you'll learn about everything that's out there. Yeah. And uh, you, you've mentioned um, the ethical use of AI uh, a few times over the course of the podcast. Um, and, and I imagine that comes up as a topic pretty regularly in these, in these news feeds that you're monitoring. Um, how, how do you think about that in the context of deploying AI? Earlier in the episode, you talked about uh, it in the uh, relative to the LLMs that are out there, um, the ethical use of LLMs. You know, how are you thinking about ethical use of AI overall? I, mean, I think it has to start with empathy, right? Um, and sorry, with making empathy? sure that what, you, yeah, with empathy, right? Um, you you have to think about the impact to humanity, uh, and and you know, from a from an ethical point of view. Um, and then, you know, I think about it, and sometimes these things are juxtaposed, uh, but from a technologist point of view as well, right? Because the the engineer in me wants to just plow forward at all costs, right? Like figure out like what can we solve? Can we can we can we cure cancer? Can we live in outer space? Can we you know uh, colonize Mars, right? Like can we do all these things? And it, it really excites me to think about what the future can be. Uh, the science fiction slash reality of the future can be um, through this technology. But then you have to pull it back a little bit and make sure that um, what you're doing is not causing more harm than good. And and the, the real examples of that are job displacement. Although I don't think uh, AI is going to necessarily replace a significant amount of jobs. I think that uh, I mean, I've said this before at, uh, at my keynote at Ad Monsters as well. I think people are at risk of losing their job if they don't learn how to use AI versus people being replaced by AI, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there's a there, there's a there's definitely a, uh, a fine line there, but it, there there is something to think about there. Um, I I, th I feel like every every person in the job market today should be thinking about how they can use AI to. Um, to improve the work that they do. Uh, it's like the smartest person you know is right there for you anytime you need them. Yeah. Uh, and, and if you're not leveraging that, then then you, you may risk falling behind. 
Um, but ethically, uh, as, as a leader at time though, uh, I'm encouraging my teams to learn and, and start to use the technology. Um, but I, I want to be very careful about our editorial use of AI, right? Um, I, I, I think that there are lots of, uh, challenges with content that is not human produced or human reviewed, um, out in the marketplace today, and that's just making for a terrible internet for everybody. Um, and so, you know, the, there's risks there. There's also risks around, I mean, this is an election year, uh, not just in the United States, but all over the world. There's, there's tons of elections happening this year. So um, we're very, very careful about, um, you know, making sure that we understand what the implications are there um, and, and communicating that. And some of the coverage time is doing is around that, right? So we we don't use AI to produce any content at time. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's 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 one of the things that we are uh, uh, absolutely like we're not going to do this uh, right now. And it's uh, to me, you know, that that's the judgments that we have to make. Uh, that doesn't mean we're not trying to use it for all other parts of business, trying to improve efficiency, trying to um build interesting digital products using the content that we already have um or even using it for use cases like tagging and and you know uh suggesting uh headlines for for authors right like th those are all things that i i think we can in the future use it for but in terms of uh making sure that we're being honest to the people that are coming to time.com or reading time magazine and know making sure those people know that what they're reading is uh real journalism and not something that an ai produced is super important and i think that's an ethical concern for us yeah i, I certainly agree that there's a lot of ethical considerations when you speak about uh, journalism in particular uh so i imagine that uh, that's really close to your heart uh as as you've made clear um so we've got uh, a great audience uh, that listens to this podcast uh, of senior executives, and uh, they're battling with the same challenges that you've gone through. Um, and you, you've really outlined nicely how you've um, tackled these things, um, you know, from the start of aligning them with the business case uh, and testing them against that. Um, how would you frame or structure uh, an AI program uh, if you were one of them? Um, what are some of the key pillars that you would really have at the foundation of your AI program if you're just getting started? Yeah, it's, um, it depends on what your goals are, right? But I, I suppose I would say start with your goals, um, yeah. right? That's the, is, is, are you going to use AI uh, to build products? Are you going to use AI to improve workflow? Are you going to use AI for quality assurance? Like, think about what your goals are and what areas of your company you want to apply AI to. Um, and once you do that, make sure to, as we discussed earlier, get alignment across the company uh, or across those departments, and then build out a plan. Build out a plan, build out a roadmap, um, and uh, evaluate the, uh, the, the ROI on that roadmap, right, uh, for each of the things that are on that roadmap. Um, and continue to do that over the course of executing that roadmap, because you may find that, um, you know, you're, you're three months into an AI project and it's not going the way you thought it would go and you're losing money on it or it's costing you more than it's worth. And, you know, be, be okay with failure, just be okay with saying, this is not something we want to continue to invest, invest in and move on to the next thing. Um, so I think that there, there's just, that's just kind of the way I would approach it. Mm -hmm. Um, but one of the most important things is making sure there's clear alignment across the board on, on what the plans are and how we're moving forward. Sometimes people call that, uh, governance, I think is, is that similar to what, uh, you're talking about in terms of alignment? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think we can, we can apply that term to it, um, you know, to me, governance sounds a little bit rigid, right, if I'm being honest. Um, and, and it may apply to certain companies, and some other companies might not want to have that rigid a process, right? Like if you're if you're a relatively small company or just starting out, uh, you know, process can sometimes be a, uh, you know, uh, it, it can slow you down a little bit, 
right? And sometimes that's good and sometimes that's not good. Right. So uh, I think it depends on the company, the size of the company, the the talent that you have and their um, their ability to stay within certain bounds or do you want to allow them to just go uh, go free and build the coolest stuff that they can possibly build and bring it back to you. So it really depends on the culture of the company and how I, how it approach how I would approach governance. But I'd call it yeah, get everybody aligned. Yeah, get in, get yeah, get in line, uh, and yeah. get everybody aligned. That's 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 good. Um, so, what are some of the 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 pitfalls that you would avoid? You would also recommend to them to avoid things that. Um, they should be looking out for. Um, so I guess it's the inverse, to a degree, it's the inverse of what you said they should be doing. Uh, but what are some common pitfalls that you would recommend to C-level executives uh, to kind of keep their ear on the ground for uh, and investigate uh, to avoid? Yeah, so when I, I think when I talked about partnerships, right, that's a double-edged sword. So what I would encourage any executive to do is um, prove out the partnership. Right. So uh, ask for a proof of concept and see if the company that you're partnering with or potentially partnering with can deliver on their promises and, and make sure that they can. Uh, and it's before signing a long term deal with them. Right. So um, there are lots of hungry startups in the AI space that are that are willing to go above and beyond to get your business. And so, you know, make sure that they have they can back that up uh so that that would be one one pitfall the other is understand what your costs are going to be um it's very confusing especially in ai with tokens and uh you know all this new this new way of thinking about how resources and compute resources are consumed make sure you understand what those costs are um i gave an example earlier of using uh or not using preview releases of software, right? Mm -hmm. One of the benefits in certain cases of using preview releases are they don't cost anything, right? Uh, so you're you're part of the, the the feedback process, but you might realize that as soon as that that thing that you built a product on that was in preview is now in general availability, all of a sudden your cost structure has changed. So I would make sure to stay on top of that. Um, and then, I mean, this isn't specific to AI, but um, you know, I think there always needs to be ownership uh, for any anything that anybody is working on, right? Like uh, in terms of a project. So make sure you have an owner, um, and that can be at the highest level or at the lowest level. But owners and deadlines are are super important, and it's one of the things I learned from uh, a former CTO at Time Inc. Uh, everybody, every task that you put on on a, uh, on, an, on a on a list of notes from a meeting has to have an owner and a deadline. Um, so those are those are some just recommendations from my experience. Um, I'm sure there are several other pitfalls uh, that uh, I'm missing, but would love to hear other people's feedback on that as well. If, if you're listening, excellent. Uh, and how could people provide that feedback to you? Uh, you can you can uh, you can email me um, or uh, I imagine this is going to be posted on uh, on LinkedIn uh, yes. there. Uh, you can comment on it. I think that would be a great start a conversation. Um, you know, it'd be interesting to also um, see if there's opportunities to bring people together and talk about this kind of stuff. Um, I've been part of a couple of groups of media CTOs and others that have come together and just kind of. You know, talk, uh, stay, stay in touch with each other, but maybe, uh, you know, that's something the Fuse team can help us put together as well. Yeah, that's uh, part of the how do you stay abreast of current technologies, right? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> talk to your peers. That's right. Absolutely. Ne network, 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 right? Uh, well, yeah. Burhan, I'm really grateful for your time today. Uh, really grateful for you uh, sharing some insights here, best practices on how you've done it. Uh, and made it successful for you. Um, certainly, it sounds like you have uh, an AI ready company. Uh, you've set up an AI ready process. And, uh, you know, I'm very appreciative of you sharing that here with us today. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is a lot of fun. Uh, maybe we'll do it again sometime in the future. Uh, it's great chatting with you. And uh, thank you.
Sounds great. And to our audience, thank you for tuning in. This is Fuse Bites. I'm your host, Nate Rakowitz, and this show is sponsored by Fuse Machines. Thank you very much.